A day that started like any other. I went outside and it was a beautiful day. I mean, it was 90 something degrees, sun beaming down. So beautiful, they couldn't imagine what was about to happen. I said, hey guys, they're telling us there's a bad storm coming, so y'all pay attention. And they looked up and they told me I was crazy. And that storm would change the lives and the town of Gerald for decades. The Gerald tornado has shaped a lot of my either conscious or unconscious decisions. The storm destroyed families, leaving devastated survivors to rebuild their town and community. I mean, I still talk to friends of mine from my class um, from 25 years ago. You know, we, they have kids that go to school here now and we see each other, but uh, just how strong the bond is, nobody, nobody can really know that. This is the Gerald Tornado, 25 years later. On this day, 25 years ago, May 27, 1997, Mother Nature's fury struck the small central Texas town of Gerald with a massive F5 killer tornado that took the lives of 27 people. The storm showed them no mercy, claiming the lives of men, women, children, and livestock. In the wake of the storm, townspeople were left with having to pick up the pieces, saying their final farewells to friends and neighbors all while the world was watching. All eyes were on the first responders who answered the call to help. It's bad down there, I wouldn't go down there. Well, they're vacating it down there. Our, our units are vacating the area, it's moving south. The death and devastation caused by an F5 tornado in Gerald 25 years ago left first responders overwhelmed. When Kevin Cranky, a commander at Williamson County EMS, first arrived on scene, basic communication was a problem. Cell phones weren't working, the paging system was down, and it was, it was very hard to communicate. And to communicate what he saw that day, he goes back in time and carefully chooses his words. It had taken out the asphalt, the house, everything, and it looked like a muddy field at the time. We ask that you leave this area immediately. Miles away, Constable Gary Griffin was helping people along I-35, where they are surrounded by funnel clouds. Big one's over there. That one, there was another one over there. There was another one over there. They were all scared. I was scared. Eventually, Constable Griffin arrives in Gerald, where his earlier fright turned to sorrow, where the search for survivors quickly turned into recovery efforts, and he emotionally recalls one discovery. She was a mom holding on to her. They were just holding each other. And they died that way. Emergency workers weren't the only ones trying to help that day. A father and son duo, Billy and Danny Williams, sprang into action as well. And these civilian searches weren't prepared for what they volunteered for. I've never seen anything as devastating as that. I expected to find something, and we didn't find anything except for just wreckage and bodies. I didn't even bother to take any pulses because they were, they were gone. There was nothing anyone could do for me. A quarter of a century later, those answering the call to help, the people of Gerald, know they did all they could for those who called Double Creek Estates home. I think the people out there probably took the best shelter available. I think they ran to an interior closet, an interior room, a hallway. They shut all the doors to the hallway. Folks, if you've seen what's left of those houses out there, it wouldn't matter. This is my first tornado. Hope it's my last. So this Gerald tornado was the last F5 in right. Texas history. This was a tornado with winds estimated at 260 miles per hour, a tornado that really is an upper echelon event. I'll always remember that day as being one of the most oppressive days. We had a front just to the northwest of us, and we had a terribly unstable atmosphere. But you know what was lacking that day? The upper level winds. They were not that strong, so we weren't looking at a big day. Mother Nature taught us something there. That means that some of these areas were experiencing these maximum winds for maybe a minute or two. And also keep in mind, Hunter, that, that storm went through a huge metamorphosis. Uh, just north of here, it had been a relatively weak tornado in the general sense. And then as it moved into Gerald, it strengthened into the uh, what was called the F5 at the time. 
Dr. Fujita referred to the EF5 as incredible damage. And I always thought, incredible? Is that a scientific word? Right. But Dr. Fujita, in one of his talks many years ago, explained to us very simply as you see incredible things. And I will tell you, in the Gerald tornado, we saw incredible things. We had reports of, of cattle whose skin was actually removed by the uh, abrasive force of the debris in the tornado. And as we pointed out, um, you, you really, as a first responder into these type situations, don't go into an EF4 or EF5 tornado expecting to find human bodies. You find parts of human bodies, and that was the dilemma that the first responders faced. And it's amazing to think Gerald at the time in 1997 was a town of 400 people. Yeah. So you have 27 right. of those 400 people. And it's just clear to me as you walk down this road, like you said, this is a community that the day after that tornado was not the same. Courtesy of my friends in the Georgetown Police Department, I was able to get into a helicopter and the one thing I remember about this roadway is seeing the roadbed in a section exposed but I'm told that probably Gerald has the most underground shelters of anywhere around South Central Texas. And you know what that is one of the things that I noticed we walk right down the street here that home has an underground right. storm cellar right now and that is because of the storm that right. moved was, through that's here. That's post 1997. Right. And at the end of this road was Miss Virginia's house who was the woman who was lofted by the tornado and found near her bathtub in a field over there, which goes to show you tornado shelter is the best place to be, but there were some people in this area that were hit by the tornado and were able to survive. Absolutely, and that's why we tell people no matter what, uh, when you hear a tornado warning, you don't need to be deciding if it's an EF1, 2, 3, or 4 no. based for your decision to be made. Go to that lowest floor, put as many walls between you and the tornado. Do what Miss Virginia did, get in a bathtub, pull something over on top of you, because you can survive. While the twister churned a path of death and destruction through the heart of Gerald, there were miracle survivors. I remember it. Went inside, I got a blanket and got in the bathtub and put it over me. I got in the tub and just started praying. I guess I was just waiting to die. Virginia Davidson and Heike Bauman, two women with similar stories and vivid memories of what happened to them on May 27th, 1997. There was like about five minutes of furniture and jumping up and down and washer and dryer jumping up and down, the house shaking and a lot of rumbling noises for about five minutes. And then all of a sudden I felt the bathtub moving. And I heard the windows splinter. I heard the wood start to crack. I felt the moorings give way and I felt it pick the whole house up and dump it over about five minutes of debris beating on my body while it was flying through the air. Started off in the bathtub, but when I landed, I didn't see a bathtub. And the bathroom landed in those trees there. And then all of a sudden, I just gradually felt it letting up, and I was able to get up and walk away. As Virginia went through her ordeal, her husband Jim was rushing home. She had a deep cut on her leg and was badly bruised, but miraculously, she was alive. I just grabbed her. I just wasn't expecting to find her alive after I saw the house. So I just can't believe anything lived through that thing. At the same time, another anxious husband was racing towards his Double Creek home. As Virginia and Heike experienced their worst nightmare, nearby, Gabriela Hernandez's wife, Isabella Maria, and their young children were in survival mode. When she saw a tornado coming, oh God. real close, about two miles away from here, she was real scared. As Hernandez got closer and closer to home, unthinkable thoughts entered his mind. I knew something real, real bad. Before, you can see all the houses. Now, the houses were gone, and the sight left him in awe. You can see all the way to the other end. But Hernandez had faith and a storm shelter underneath his home, and his prayers of finding his family alive were answered when they emerged from their underground hiding place. She was surprised real bad because she didn't see nothing around. I mean, all the houses was gone. Everything, you know, was gone. And what remained was his entire world. I have my family here. 
To this day, many wonder why them and not me. They soon discovered they weren't alone. Psychologically, many are still dealing with survivor's guilt. I just dropped down on my knees before I left out of the office and I said, God, take me if you take somebody because they've got families. Without hesitation, Brenda Cooper was willing to give her own life. Oh, I was, had lived a good life. If it meant sparing another's. We tear something apart. When the winds picked up. We were just getting hammered with leaves and paper and shreds and everything. And the tornado neared. Then you could see it lifting up and going over that way. Cooper sought shelter deep in her family's rock quarry. When the coast was clear, she and her son headed out to First Street to help. So I knew the officer and I said, what can we do? He said, do you have rubber tired loaders? And I said, yes. He said, bring them, please, quick. I got a hold of my son and one of our workers and I said, come on, let's go to Double Creek. So you were helping to pick up the debris? Well, that's what we thought, but we were actually picking up bodies. They were putting the picking up body parts and putting them into those buckets of the tractors. And I describe it as some things that no one should ever see. Chris Arlt was 16. At first, I felt guilty whenever we had, you know, some of my classmates that, that passed away. Psychiatrist Joanne Sotelo says survivor's guilt is very common, and those feelings should never be minimized, regardless of how much time has passed. It, it's almost confusing, right, because people don't understand you survived why are you feeling bad and it could come from why me why am I special like it happened to someone else and not to me or they also have a guilt of I could have done more and I didn't especially if they were there every time uh, they say tornado warning we pay attention the thoughts the fear resurface when severe weather hits just like in March it came back really quick. A tornado formed in the same area in Gerald. The route was coming from the west, headed north, headed that way when that other one came because County Road 305 got hit again. Arlt also says he's definitely become hyper aware of any change in the forecast. It kind of makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck when, when there's you know, thunderstorms or, you know, thoughts of tornadoes, even even the mention of tornado warnings, it just kind of everything kind of stops. And he stops and thinks about the friends he lost. John Ruiz was in my class and then Eric Mooring was also in my class. Probably a day or two before we were just up here running, playing basketball all day long. Dr. Sotelo says it's important to hold on to the positive memories like that, but also have awareness. If you find yourself feeling uneasy, there are ways to cope. Establish the sense of safety. Allow yourself permission to grieve and feel the emotions. Share them. If it starts to interfere with your day-to-day -day functioning, do seek help. Not necessarily with a professional, but just connect with other people. Talk and share your feelings. For people living in Gerald, the deadly storm still haunts many. But for one KV photojournalist, the memories that haunt him are the ones he saw firsthand through the lens of his camera. The sometimes powerful images we see on TV news. It's the job of the photojournalist to take these pictures. People like Scott Guest, who's been capturing live and on tape the big news stories for decades. Scott is in his 28th year as a photojournalist for KVU. He's pretty much seen it all through his viewfinder. And on May 27, 1997, Scott witnessed firsthand the fury of nature. Like first responders, news photographers are often first on the scene of disasters. Scott's Gerald Tornado story begins at a routine mid-afternoon newsroom meeting at the KVU studios. In the afternoon meeting, the weather uh, uh, person came in and said, uh, hey, this is a huge storm, it's already spawned a tornado in Waco and it's continuing to come this direction. We are picking up an apparent rotation in this particular storm. We well, me and Greg Rugan just jumped rotation. in the car and we started driving north. Uh, I was scanning constantly while I was driving. Out of the cloud, I saw the needle start to come down. Parked on the frontage road real quick and jumped out as fast as I could and started, started shooting. And as we continued to watch it, 
it slowly closed the distance on us. Some reporters wait their whole life to see a twister. There it is, full grown and about a thousand yards from I-35. I'll never forget that uh, Greg Rugen, he's like, okay, man, at, at some point we got to, you know, we got to move. And uh, so we tore down and, and moved. But as soon as we set back up again, it was even larger. It was tremendously large, way bigger than anything that we had witnessed up to that point. We had to remain and go into Gerald from, from where, where it hit just moments after uh, it, had, it had happened. It just looked like a muddy field. And we uh, talked to a couple people and uh, asked him, you know, what, where are the houses? From where those people are standing in the yellow jacket right there, from there over was houses. What was a neighborhood with grass yards and everything was now just foundations and mud. Just massive destruction. And I kind of felt sick to my stomach and we had to stay there for like a week. It really uh, powerfully affected me, how I thought about news after that point and, and shooting events like that. The historic F5 tornado may have destroyed much of Gerald, but it did not destroy the will of the people to move forward. They will never forget the 27 who died, but they honor their memories by living. Life goes on, and throughout the years, the city of Gerald and its residents have weathered the storm. Back in 1997, it was a town of just a few hundred people. Many people in Gerald had family in the area tracing back to the 1800s a close-knit community, a place where everybody knew everybody. It's huge. The devastating twister taking the town by surprise. I was at my in-laws in their house. It took everything but their bathroom. That's where we were. It flattened homes, twisted steel, spread debris for miles, taking life and memories. When that was ignited, I don't know how we made it because there's a lot of people right around us that didn't. But we made it. And I don't know why, except that there's a reason and we'll know that someday because God had a plan for us somewhere. Today, the community is growing. Developments are going up all over town. More schools are being built as Gerald ISD prepares to go from under 3,000 students this year to more than 10,000 in the next 10 years. Still a small central Texas town, but the dynamics are changing. The latest census data shows more than 2,300 people call it home. At points in time in the quiet of the night, I kind of sit there and go, how the hell are we going to keep up with this thing? Larry Bush was elected to the city council in 2007 before he became mayor in 2014. One of his key priorities is keeping Gerald booming. He's expecting more people to move in with companies like Tesla opening and Samsung expanding in central Texas. The biggest challenge we've had as a small city is identifying and bringing in the talents and skills that we need to help us grow in the future. But the growth can only happen so fast. And Gerald often competes with bigger cities in the southwest part of Williamson County for infrastructure needs. Because it's bigger than that now. Mayor Bush says the city needs more water, more sewer and transportation. In the next 15 years, Gerald will need more than 15 million gallons extra per day. He compares it to Round Rock back in the late 70s. But it's not lost on Mayor Bush where the town came from. The family members who will have missed out on birthdays with their loved ones lost in the tornado. There'll always be some number of people that remember the tornado, remember Gerald for the tornado. The rest of us are going to look at where we, what we are today and what we're going to become and the fact that this is one of the best places in Texas to live. The day Gerald was hit by the F5 tornado was a day that started out like any other day for the more than 400 people who called the town home. They got up in the morning, they went to work, they went about their daily business, but as the day progressed, something was brewing up above. Texas was about to be hit with a tornado outbreak. 
On that day, nearly two dozen tornadoes were reported, but none of them had the strength, power and size of the twister that tore apart the small town. The morning of May 27, 1997 was extremely humid. Dew point values had surged into the mid and upper 70s across central Texas as humid air surged in off the Gulf of Mexico. This humidity was pooling with a cold front located just north of the area. Now this day did not check all of the boxes for a classic severe weather setup. It was lacking wind shear that we would typically look for. However, by the late morning and early afternoon, extreme instability values had built up across central Texas. Weakening storms from the night prior over Oklahoma and northeast Texas produced a gravity wave which moved into our area. And with all of these factors, the stage was set for explosive storms to develop that afternoon and evening. Altogether, there were 22 tornadoes that touched down across central and south central Texas, and this includes other notable tornadoes close to home. The Cedar Park F3 and the Lakeway F4 both touched down on the afternoon of the 27th. Now, the Gerald tornado is the one that we continue to remember. It started as a smaller rope-like tornado, but quickly strengthened into an F5, the last to touch down in this state with maximum winds of at least 261 miles per hour. The path moving north to south in an unusual motion was 7.6 miles long and took the tornado right over the Double Creek Estates with a maximum width of three quarters of a mile wide. This tornado, again the last F5 in the state, killed 27 people in the town of Gerald. In the days after the tornado tore through Gerald, the already tired and shocked community had to say their final farewells to the 27 who died. Funeral after funeral, prayers were said, touching words were spoken. And by some coincidence, the final resting place for many is in a cemetery in Georgetown. Rewinding back 25 years, Kimberly Garrett doesn't just see graves. She sees memories and the stories of each family that was killed by the tornado in Gerald. First, she showed us the Igos, a well-known family of five, Joan, Jerry, John, Paul, and Audrey. Then she showed us the Morin graves, a beloved family of four, Cindy, Keith, Eric, and Ryan. And then we found the Smiths. Garrett says she still works for the city of Georgetown and will never forget the day of the tornado in Gerald or the victims. And then it was probably a day or two later when um, the families, you know, started to think about where they needed to bury their loved ones. And um, some of the families came in, as you know, the Igos, the Moorings, and the Smiths all chose to have their loved ones buried here in Georgetown. And that process um, was very emotional um, as well to deal with that, um, that devastation. To this day, loved ones and old friends stop by to pay their respects. Gone, but never forgotten. The date. 527 will always be remembered as a day everything changed for the people of Gerald. Everyone seems to recall where they were and what they were doing when the tornado swept through. We spoke with a few teachers about how they managed to escape. The tornado came right down here. 25 years later. The weird thing that I always say was weird was they show all these tornado damage. And the emotions are still raw. On the TV, oh, hold on. The memory of that day and what Gerald coach Drew Sumner witnessed. You show all the tornado damage on the TV and. Stays. There's houses, you can see them kind of wrecked. These were, everything was down to the slab. Everything was gone. I was working on some schoolwork in another building and they said, there's a tornado. And I thought, oh my God, I left my son in the 1916 building. So I go run upstairs, 1916 building, and I get him. With one son in tow, Sumner jumped in his car and raced to grab his other child at daycare a few miles away. And we could look in the rearview mirror and saw this little skinny tornado behind us. And all the roads on I-35 going to Gerald, all the cars on I-35 were stopped. In the minutes it took for him to get to his second son, the tornado had intensified. I looked back to where it was and I said, what the hell is that? That's like the rain cloud from hell. It's like two miles wide. Nearby. I did have my son with me that day. Gerald pre-K teacher Jackie Puska and her three-month-old Cole. He doesn't know anything happened. Rode out the storm in her bedroom closet. And he just was hanging out in his little car seat carrier. And so I grabbed formula, water, diapers, wipes, some clothes. Uh, my cell phone. Pasca and her son had been on the same campus as Coach Sumner that day. It was a teacher work day, 
And afterwards, some staff members had met up for a baby shower. Um, we were in the baby shower and someone came in and said, the weather looks like it's going to start getting bad. Um, you guys w might want to start finishing up. And Jackie Puska and Drew Sumner both survived. But it's not lost on them how the story had a different ending for some friends and loved ones. Went to a lot of funerals. Yep, whole families were passed and there were quite great stories about people that survived, but horrible stories about people that passed. That's so sad. Yeah. It's, the, the saddest thing about it is that they didn't get to grow up, they didn't get to graduate, didn't get to get married, have kids. I, I still can't believe this, this is really real. Um, I think there was definitely disbelief and shock, but then also the community of Gerald started doing what they've always done, which is they started helping others. We kind of call it the Gerald way. What you see here and inside is probably an eighth of what we have. For months, there were countless donation drives offering food, water, and clothes. The Gerald School stepped up in a big way and became a hub for kids and their parents to get help. Share is a great word. That sense of community, neighbors always coming together, remains a huge reason why she's never left the district. I'll be finishing up my 28th year this year here in this district. The same sentiments ring true for Coach Sumner, who's now going on his 33rd year with JISD. Wish we protect each other, we support each other, and it's just what we do. 13 of the 27 people who died on May 27, 1997, were children who were being denied living a full life. They would never grow to adulthood. They would never have children of their own and they would never graduate high school. For Gerald's valedictorian, Shara Stigdon, the sudden loss of her classmates hit her hard. In a small town, nobody's a stranger, and her classmates were all like family. Like others, memories from that day are tough to remember. That's why she chooses to remember the good times and live her day to honor their memories. Shara Stigdon, 18 years old, the 1997 valedictorian at Gerald High School young, impressionable, and ready to take on the world. That was basically the theme of the whole speech, is just to step out with your best foot and lead life as you can. Shara's message, both encouraging and even comforting, words she spoke four days before the historic F5 tornado tragically touched down in Gerald, touching the lives of everyone in the small central Texas town. Of the 27 who died, nearly half were Shara's classmates. It was the pivotal moment of me truly being aware of how big life is. Today, she's Shara Farr. She lives in Dripping Springs. Her son just finished fourth grade. She's a professor at Texas State University teaching the next generation of school principals. Her life is full. But all the life lessons I learned from it are just embodied in my everyday decisions. Our strength is our story. And I have to remind myself of that every day. Her story, one of empathy, an understanding of how fragile life can be, knowing some days may bring more storms than others. The experience of the Gerald tornado created this deeper sense of awareness, not necessarily of the environmental elements like, oh, there's a storm coming, but the storms that are inside of us the tornadoes that each of us carry each and every day, but can't be seen on a weather radar. Even though it's been 25 years since this tornado over Gerald destroyed everything in its path, it did not destroy her memory of the close-knit community. There's just so many memories of being together in that small town together. Flipping through her old yearbook, the pictures bring back memories. Page after page, a reminder of the lives cut short. She can't help but wonder what her classmates, like Audrey Iga, who died with her entire family, could have become. I've gone through different chapters of life. I sometimes in my head think, so Audrey, this is what it was like to get married. Regardless of what her next chapter brings, it's the life lessons from Gerald she learned many years ago that stay with her. You'll never separate your self's identity from your past, but it's really how you choose it to go forward. What one man saw through the lens of a disposable camera 
is something he will never forget. And to this day, he can describe the tornado as if he were looking at it right now. We spoke with Ryan Beck about what he saw and heard that day as he drove north on I-35. But little did he know the town of Gerald was about to experience that terror head on. It was just super humid, but it was absolutely blue skies. 25 years ago this week, Ryan Beck and a friend were heading back to college in Waco after a road trip. We always kind of found the adventures, but this one was not one we were looking for. They pulled off Interstate 35 at this gas station in Gerald when the blue skies changed. And then we came back out of the store and that's when we saw a small tornado. Now Beck says he liked taking pictures at the time, but he didn't have a camera with him. I went back inside and got a disposable camera and ran up on the 35 and started taking photos. It was over, he says, in five or 10 minutes. It was literally an F-Zero tornado. There's nothing to it. I mean, I'd almost call it cute. It was funny. Until it wasn't. That's when it got really bad. An EF-5 tornado was forming. The thing just goes. A storm churning with a power that hasn't been seen in Texas. And it was barreling down. In the 25 years since. And the entire sky is just funneling into it. I can't explain it. Man, that tornado turned into a huge deal back there. And I just remember the noise. Apocalyptic is probably one of the better words I could probably find. It didn't seem real. It didn't seem like it was something that you could escape. There was no place to hide. It settles in, and then you're like, what do we do? What they did was put down the camera, get in the car. And all I could see is tornado. And try to outrun the storm. There was a vacuum in the air. The intake, we couldn't get the car above like 2,000 RPM to go to the third gear. After being pummeled with what he remembered as baseball sized hail, we were literally driving like this. The two got past the storm and thought about going back to help. And there was another tornado in Belton. I didn't want to mess with that one anymore. And we just kind of felt pinned for a little bit, but we just kept going north and got lucky. 25 years ago, KVU journalists were on the ground in Gerald reporting on one town's devastation. While they professionally reported on the events of the day and the days that followed, they also showed compassion and mourned with the people they met. Meanwhile, others worked for hours and hours in the studio to keep Central Texans informed. But no matter where they were and what they were doing, the experiences of that day remain with them. Here's a familiar face if you watched KVU News during the 80s and 90s. That's Judy Maggio. But Judy was and is much more than a news reader. At heart, she's a reporter, and a good one. And like many reporters who covered the biggest local news story of 1997, that terrible tornado at Gerald, Judy spent a lot of time away from the anchor desk back then to report on the people devastated by a storm and dedicated to helping rebuild their shattered community. The people of Gerald are rebuilding their homes and their lives thanks to the generosity of others. The school's gym, once filled with tons of donated goods, is now filled with fun and competition. The community spirit. I mean, you just saw people helping their neighbors, picking up what they could of what the storm left behind, but in a lot of places there wasn't a lot. So what people did was open up their homes to give their neighbors shelter. Another former KVU journalist remembers the Gerald Tornado too. She's now a television executive in Dallas, Carolyn Mungo, who recalls the strength of the young people whose friends died in the tornado. I talked to a lot of kids who they knew had probably lost some of their best friends, but they allowed us to put microphones on them and they wanted to talk. Last Friday, Shara Stingdon was standing at a podium the valedictorian of Gerald High School's senior class. Today, she sits trying to erase what happened four days later. Sometimes you just have to. So that way you can keep, it keeps you from crying or breaking down or knowing that you just lost a friend. It'll just keep you going if you think about something else. I've covered a lot. I was a reporter for 20 years, and I will never forget coming up on North I-35 and looking off to really nothing. And as we got on the ground closer, seeing livestock wrapped around utility poles and the silence, there was no sound.
I've never seen anything like it. The devastation is hard to describe. You know, you had entire neighborhoods where the only thing left was the slab of the houses. You know, usually when you see tornado damage, you see uh, the roof is blown in, um, the garage was ripped off the house, a tree is tumped over, but you don't see an entire neighborhood lifted off the slab and sucked up into a funnel cloud. But that's what happened with that F5 tornado in Gerald. 25 years ago, it seems like only yesterday. Texans are resilient and the people of Gerald have truly banded together in what they refer to as a Gerald way. They help each other out. As they move forward towards the future, it's important that they never forget the past and those who tragically lost their lives. We dedicate this program to them.